Thank you, Max. Um, my talk is going to be a bit more of a story, uh, not really structured, or, uh, I guess it's more about my experience coming as a foreigner into a developing country and um, having been given a task uh, as part of a program that I will tell you about and how did I go and how uh, the work that I had done previously in Victoria applied to that work overseas in development and in emergency management uh, in GIS. So hopefully relevant to you in the sense that it would be a lot of um, it's, it's the, the biggest emergencies that are related with flooding. So that would be relevant to most of you. So I just, but yeah, it's going to be more of a story of my experience. So hopefully you find it interesting or entertaining. So first of all, um, just so you know, um, I was part of what's called the Australian Volunteers for International Development, or also known as AVID. Um, this is, back then, I, I left in 2013, back then was managed by OSAID, which doesn't longer exist, and I was part of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and sadly the, the budget reductions uh, that are currently <laughs> under, uh, under the current government have meant that at the moment the program is um, frozen, so they're trying to rethink about it, but the, the way it works is um, they allocate skilled professionals in a particular field to developing nations that have been identified by Australian government as a priority and uh, they allocate professionals to specific jobs, they advertise a the job, they send you there, you get a small allowance to, to live for the time being and hopefully you make a difference to the country as well as becoming a better professional so you bring skills back to Australia so it's meant to be a, a win-win so I applied for this job, which um, originally was defined as a who was it? vulnerability mapping officer. So they wanted someone who would do um, like community mapping for um, evacuation routes and um, vulnerable areas to flooding and things like that. I applied, and they wanted someone who spoke Spanish, and I'm from Spain, so that was <laughs> uh, gave me a lot of points. So I went over there. And um, I'm guessing, for me, it was very, very well-known destination because in, in Spain, uh, this is a very touristic uh, spot to go for honeymoons and so on. Uh, so I'm not sure if any of you will be familiar with that name, but this island is in the Caribbean. It's right next to Cuba and, and Jamaica. And um, it's on the same uh, island as um, Haiti, which everyone knows, sadly, because of the earthquakes. It's got 10 million people living in it, and the size of it, that figure might not mean much, but it's one fifth of the size of Victoria. So that uh, already raises uh, an issue with the uh, obviously population density, and anything that happens there will have a, a large impact <coughs> on the population. Uh, it's a tropical um, weather, so hot all the time, but they've got a rainy season and a not quite dry season, but not as rainy season. <laughs> And they, they don't even call it rainy season, they call it the hurricane season. Because um, where it is located in the Atlantic, it's just on the, on the natural pathway for all the cyclones that develop, or the hurricanes. They call it the, the developing in West Africa and go all the way to Florida, so it's right in the middle of that path. And um, the hurricane season goes between June and November. However, it's, not, um, and it's, it's quite common that there is big storms happening outside that period. Um, it's, I thought it was a, a poor country before going, but it's actually considered a middle-income country because of um, the, the GDP and the growth um, in the last few decades has been growing. But um, when you look at those figures, you think, okay, they're not doing too badly. But then you look at the World Bank figures and 40% of the population live below the poverty line. So again, uh, that, well, that, that starts to highlight the, the, the contrasts. Uh, there's a lot of rich people there but there is a majority of very poor population. And the economy has a large um, component by, from tourism. So just a few photos to highlight the, the contrasts that you expect from those figures. This is where I was expecting. This is all I knew about the island. And that really exists. But like those, those destinations I visited, um, hotels, that's 
me on my normal Saturday afternoon <laughs> drink to the beach. Um, but that's also where I found that. That is um, maybe middle class, low middle class neighborhood in the capital city. My workmates at the I worked at the emergency commission. I haven't said yet. Um, my workmates were professionals. Um, most of them with a university degree, and uh, maybe they had electricity at home twice a week, running water once a week, and this is the middle class. This is a school. Um, this is a, you see that very dark population indicates are immigrants from Haiti, which means they they are the poorest of the poorest. So that school, as you can see, has no electricity and they have no tables and not really any material. So this is my husband giving a class there, um, just as a, a bit of an extra activity that we did. Um, the, the education problem, I think, was what uh, made it, was is what's stopping the country in emergency management and in other areas <coughs> from progressing because they don't have education, uh, they don't have quality teachers, they don't have, the, you talk to people who have a degree in law and they still don't know how to write a document, for example, so it's pretty, pretty shocking. That is a flood event. This is the capital city. This is one of the neighborhoods in the in the city. It, that along the banks, like it happens in many developing countries. People settle, people with no income, they settle in land that no one else wants. So they settle their neighborhood in by the river bank. Every time there is a flood event, that's what happens. So that is quite a from 2007. Every time that happens, the People who can't evacuate, those that don't want to, a lot of people don't want to evacuate, they stay, they lose it all, sadly a lot of them die. The flood event goes, they come back in another five years, happens again. So there is no solution because there is nowhere else where these people can go at the moment because it's, it's not, they don't have the skills, they learn, the education, the income, and so on. This photo, it um, comes from that photo. So this is um, not a natural <coughs> flood event. This is, um, there was a storm. This storm happened in 2007, I think it was uh, November. 30 days later, or 25 days later, there was another storm. And that happened, but that happened because the authorities didn't open the dam wall in time. So I think they had about 40 people dying on that second event. And they died because by the time they opened that wall, it was too late and the water that came out was just, this is one of the big cities. Just the, the flooding event was much larger, much, much worse than the one a few weeks earlier. And it was the authorities fault for not, probably for not managing the information properly, for not communicating and for all those steps along the way that got <coughs> uh, missed. So as you probably have guessed right now, Flooding, uh, <laughs> hurricanes and tropical storms is the, the biggest threat to the country. And there I just have some figures of um, communities and percentage of population according to the emergency commission that are vulnerable to flood events. Um, in the middle here you've got, this is from NOAA, from the US um, Weather Authority. These are all the tropical storms that have crossed the country over the last 150 years. So, very active. Also, <clears throat> uh, a big one is earthquakes. Um, not that it's happened yet. Although there's been a few uh, big ones, like the one in 1946. But um, the alarm just uh, raised recently with the event in Haiti, which is the capital city, Port of Prince. It's only a couple of hundred kilometers from the capital city of the Dominican Republic. So now they realize that they have to do something about it in terms of preparation and building codes and so on. So they're starting to, to work on that. So. Just moving on what I actually did. Uh, as I said, they, they told me that I was going to do maps, which I thought that's pretty cool. That's what I do at work. I'll just go and do some maps. <laughs> but then when I got there, I realized that they've got maps. They've got United Nations, European Union, Spanish Agency, um, also Americans. Everyone goes there and they do a project. They do lots of pretty maps about evacuation routes. And they do this flood modeling for this village and this and this. and they print a report and they give them a CD, give them to the community, they take lots of photos, they shake hands, they go, nothing ever changes. So when I got to the emergency commission and I spoke to my counterpart and to the head of the commission, we thought, why don't we do something that is actually going to um, affect the country more um, 
globally and that will have some, it will grow, not just, just a CD or, or a map of books. So they put me in charge of um, coordinating the establishment of this group called AGEO, which um, it's uh, from Spanish, it's, uh, how would you translate that? It's an interinstitutional team for geospatial management in emergencies or something like that. So, oh, there you go, I translated it there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need to get this much effort. <laughs> so this was um, before my arrival, they had a team from from the UN, from um, uh, UNOSA, I think it's, it's called, they do the emergency management and space um, information for, for emergency management. So they said, you need to create a group of GIS professionals from multiple agencies that come to the emergency commission as a hub for managing information in those events and you need to do crisis mapping and information management and so on. So I, I go there and um, my, my tasks involve um, coordinating this, gathering data, storing data, and sharing data uh, to generate information for, to support decision making in all the phases, all the, the emergency management cycle. So um, that sounds, you can say quickly, but there's many challenges that um, stopped us from achieving many things very quickly. Um, the first one, the Emergency Commission, um, it's a government agency where they have absolutely no technology, um, no data, they don't even know what GIS, what databases are. They have no infrastructure, like the electricity will go off every day a number of times. Um, there was not even running water in, uh, <laughs> in the building, so how can they become the technology hub for emergency management for the whole country? So that, that was uh, number one challenge. However, there were other agencies. So emergency commission is like a coordination agent among all of the government agencies. So they had um, the geology department, the environment department, and the cadaster. All these agencies had the GIS department, so they have the, the managed information. But uh, the problem is that those people that did have information wanted to keep it within their own agency, which I imagine happens in every country, not just in developing countries. So they didn't want to share the information because information is power, because they got money from UN to develop this project, and if I give it to you, then I, I lose my power. So that was a, another uh, challenge. And as I said before, everyone had maps, but paper maps don't really solve any situation. And the world culture, a uh, big one. Even though I'm from Spain, so I speak the same language, uh, and I thought I would work with these people very easily, it's just that coming from Australia and before that from Spain, it's just a completely different approach to work. Um, you need to allow maybe two or three hours of your day to socialize. So <laughs> I knew I had only 12 months to achieve a lot of tasks. And then. It's just like the public service. It's a day. Maybe for you. <laughs> Yeah, so like a public service, but 10 times yeah, right. more children. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to learn. At first it would annoy me, so I would not want to talk to people, and I would tell them I'm very busy, I need to achieve this, and eventually I learned that I had to take my time to have my three or four coffees a day, and, and ask everyone about the families and all that. And by doing that, I actually achieved a lot more, because people trust me, and they became my friends, and that opened me door, like doors to go to other people, agencies, and so on. So that, that was a bit of learning. <laughs> and um, well, this is just this is my counterpart. So they allocate someone within the agency that's going to stay until you go. So this person will continue the work that you start, which is a very good idea. So this is um, we sat for a few days and we decided my work was going to be focusing on those four areas. So the green one there was about all about gathering data. So going to all of the different agencies that are involved in disaster management in government and asking them what data do you have that's in, in, in spatial format and we're going to ask permission to grab it, take it to the emergency commission, put it in a database and make it available for any crisis. So this is in order to replicate a crisis room like we've got here, like the state emergency center. So the first task was identifying this data and ask permission to use it. Then we moved into the orange one was um, response um, activation of the group. So this is about having GIS professionals or data professionals that will be 
gathered in a crisis room and provide uh, maps, data, water or flood modeling, uh, estimated time of arrival of a flood, um, so on. All of this, we, we needed to develop um, protocols about how that was going to work. And then the next one was uh, data gaps. Even though they have some data, like I'm talking about elevation models or um, uh, streams, um, uh, they've got aerial imagery, they, but they don't have things like um, a roads, a shelters, a hospital database. Like we needed to identify what was missing and how we were going to create them. And then we were, I spent quite a lot of time uh, looking for support for training and for some budget for multiple projects for the future. So that, that are the four streams of work that I spent time with. And just a few examples of um, uh, this, this one, which is a gathering data. Um, we managed in the time I was there to get money from the Spanish government and engage a consultant who built an um, open source database and put the, all the data that we managed to gather from the different agencies. So I was so lucky to be able to sign agreements with the 14 member agencies. I saw with the, some of the ministers, um, for some reason, they, if you're white, and you're a foreigner, yeah. you have respect from everyone. They think you know everything, even though you're not. And I was a volunteer, but they still um, trusted me. So they, the ministers would open me the door of the office and they would sign the agreement that they would give me the data a lot easier than they would have done with a local. Sad, but that's how it was. I, uh, we developed um, a tender process. We engaged a consultant and using open source software only, they built the database, which is now functioning some, except for problems such as um, they still don't have money to pay for the internet bill at the emergency commission so <laughs> you know it's it's frustrating uh, so there's a lot of problems but there's always things stopping it from from moving ahead in terms of a crisis room uh, this is uh, I, I used to work for the department of sustainability and I was part of uh, during the summer I was part of what's called the bushfire rats which is a um, was fire rapid risk assessment team. So I wanted to replicate that, which is a group of specialists get together in a room and they assess impacts and they provide information to the decision makers. So that's what I spent a lot of time doing was establishing some protocols about crisis mapping. So how do we map a flood? So we use satellite imagery. How do we classify the imagery to determine the flood extent? Um, and so on, how uh, lots of documentation. So, how is the thing going to be structured? Who is going to activate it? Whose responsibility is it? Where is it the, the, the office that we're going to work in? And a lot of base work so they can start to actually deploy people. And I also spend a lot of time giving training. So, we only, I only encourage them to use open source because um, the other problem with development with um, international aid is that some countries get um, a package of money and they buy a license to use a particular software package. Then the, the aid money expires, the license expires, and then what do they do? <laughs> it, it, so um, we thought even though, and especially because they're going to be doing fairly basic analysis to start with, they don't need the most advanced software to start with. So using quantum GIS, which maybe some people have heard of, which is open source, just it, it does most things that you can do with a commercial software. And also with the assistance of, I use the Argentinian Space Agency and the German uh, Development Agency, they gave me some help to prepare remote sensing. So using satellite, international satellites to analyze um, events and come up with flood extent. So that's uh, the two training courses that I provided a few times. And then some examples of data gaps. So. They didn't have a, a roads and bridges network, so that's fairly basic. If you want to um, evacuate a particular community uh, for an event, uh, you want to know what's the quickest way. So if you've got a flat extent and you overlap that with the roads network, it will tell you, okay, I can, the, the emergency services will know I cannot access from here, so I go by helicopter or there is a harbor here, or I've got international aid coming, so where can I deploy it? So, you need these not as maps but as, as, as data to be able to take these decisions. Um, so we put together a proposal to get funding to develop that um, 
the data set. This one may be more relevant to all of you. Um, surprisingly, the, what happened with that uh, flooding event where they had people die because they opened the wall without planning? It's because they fed and have a digital elevation uh, model that uh, I create an app to predict uh, flooding. So they all they get is a, the weather agency saying, yep, we think we're going to have 200 millimeters of rain for the, na the next week. And they just go based on local knowledge. Oh, okay, oh, that means maybe we should evacuate this community and this community based on what's happened in the past. But what we put together, with the, together with the geology department, was a proposal to actually do some proper modeling, like uh, feel like we ideally have like lidar flown so high uh, high accuracy elevation model. If not, at the very least, uh, identify the the most risky catchments and go into some cross sections and and come up with some sort of um, uh, idea. So when you get a forecast of millimeters of rain, then you know how much time you've got based on on, on, on that data. So we put a a proposal together to get funding to develop that. And this is a very simple one, it just highlights how sometimes with no money you can achieve a bit. This is um, civil defense, it's a component of the emergency commission, they are the first responders. Um, if there is road accidents or any any type of emergency, they, they are the first responders. So they, I ask them, the they, uh, Dominican Republic is rated as the most dangerous place for like driving with the highest rate of accident in the world, or not face the same. And I ask them, how do you know what, what are the dangerous uh, parts? Like, where did you go? And they say, oh, we just know so many people die here, so many people die there. So I said, why don't you start mapping where your accidents occur so you can start planning for the future about where your road uh, improvement works to focus on? And they said, oh, but we, we don't know how to do GIS. So it was a very simple exercise. I just set up um, Google Docs, like a spreadsheet on Google Docs, and all they had to do is the person that gets a phone call for attending an accident would just write down the address or the closest address to where they were attending, and then someone else in the IT department would look at these Google Docs every day and they would go to Google Maps. I would uh, give a lot long to that event, and then from the lot long, I set up a, this is a quantum GIS map that reads the lot long. Um, that so if they can take that and put it on the website at least people can see where the accidents are happening every day so it was just an exercise to give them an idea how they can start using data uh, in a more uh, useful way um, so yeah, there's some examples of work I did and then um, these are some of the agencies I worked with the UN Spider which is a, a United Nations agency that uses satellite imagery for emergency management uh, United States helped us a lot um, with, um, they've got a very cool system for uh, field, um, for first responders, they go out to do, whenever there is an event, they go, they take a, uh, just an iPhone, an iPad, any, any device, and they capture the building, the access buildings, uh, assess the damage in a particular area. And it's just a very simple data collection form that gets connected to the emergency commission, um, and then in real time, people taking the decision can assess what the condition of the buildings are, or the community are. So anyway, the, the US, um, the Southern Command, which is part of the army, just came and helped us to implement a similar system in the Dominican Republic. And there's CONAI, the Argentinian Space Agency, that gave us um, some funding for training, and uh, yeah, a lot of uh, relationship building. Um, and I'm, I'm still in touch with them, and I, I'm happy to hear that they're still progressing. So just recently, I think two weeks ago, they got another chunk of training from the German um, geography institution, I think, on again, on some modeling and some, some mapping techniques. So it's coming along, but they still have a lot of um, challenges ahead, mostly to do with um, the politics of the country, which I um, don't know if maybe in the next presentation we can hear how it works in Victoria. But they, they're not progressing because um, yeah, the information, uh, they still want to protect the information. They are worried about um, the, the short term, like they just want power. So a lot of people that are currently holding powerful positions, they don't want to take risky situations, or, uh, risky uh, decisions. And it's just, uh, they're just worried about their own success, and not so much about the success of the organization. I, I don't know if that happens here as much, but oh, definitely no. there, it happens a lot. 
Um, one thing I learned was, not because I'm a Duas person, I really think Duas <laughs> It's a good, um, it's a key to bring different disciplines together because I'm not a flood management person or a fire person or an ecologist, but I learned that because I communicate all these specialists, uh, I, I bring information from all of them into one hub, mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. bring them all together and I learn the language of one and then I learn the language of the other. So I am forced to understand them all. So I think GIS has a very a strong potential to, to be a good link for emergency management because we bring all disciplines together. Um, also, I learned, I was surprised by how much power they gave me. And I think it's because I was so enthusiastic, I loved what I was doing so much, that somehow, I don't know, they, I achieved a lot more than I thought, just, just probably, I think, because of the attitude. And um, yeah, the, the, the importance of those three things. So how, it, if, if, if agencies collaborate together for a common goal, rather than working for their own benefit, they could achieve a lot more than <laughs> that they're doing. Um, how training is important. Uh, people that they just lack in training, they just don't, they cannot achieve because they don't know best, they, they, they don't know what to do. And it's very sad to see how that limits the, the, the development. And also the long-term vision, which I think pretty sure that's a problem everywhere. Because this is government agencies and they're only focusing on short-term goals and short-term budget. They just don't invest enough in the future. They're just worried about what the press is going to say the next week mm -hmm. and not about what's actually beneficial for the long term. So, yeah, that's it. That uh, summarizes um, the experience.